Welcome to this webinar, in which we will give you a taste of the program, the BA program in linguistics at the University of Amsterdam. My name is Kees Hengeveld. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Amsterdam, and I'm also the coordinator of the BA program. Other presenters today will be Eva van Lier and Judith Rispens, my colleagues, and our international st student, Sinja Stentot. Today we will give you two uh, small and short sample classes so that you can get an idea of the content of the program. We will also talk about the organization of the program and we will talk about how it is to be a student at the University of Amsterdam and how it is to live in Amsterdam. You can ask your questions throughout this session, but we will also answer questions afterwards. Now, the program has three main components. One component concerns language structure and variation. Here we study questions like how are languages organized, what are the main building blocks, how do they develop over time, how they do they differ from one another. The second component concerns linguistic behavior. How do we acquire languages? How do we lose a language? How do we lose a language? Uh, how do we uh, know more about the functioning of the brain? How is language stored in the brain? And how do disorders arise? And the third component is the acquisition of a language. We call this language X. We think it's important that the notions that you uh, are taught about in the linguistics classes can be applied to, f to data from concrete languages, and that's why we ask you to study a language in the first year. This language that we call language X will give you a language learning experience that's important in other classes. For instance, in phonetics classes, we will ask you about the sounds of the language you're studying. In the syntax class, we will ask you about the structures that are, uh, are used in the language that you're studying. Uh, so in this class, we will ask you to use your language data to get a better grip on linguistic notions. You can choose from many different languages. If you're not fluent in Dutch, then you can have classes taught in English or in the target language on several languages. These are Czech, Dutch, Frisian, Hebrew, Italian, Polish, Sign Language of the Netherlands, and Swedish. If you're fluent in Dutch, you have a number of additional options. You can then also choose Arabic, Classical Greek, Danish, French, Latin, Modern Greek, Norwegian, Russian, Serbian Croatian, and Spanish. There are many languages to choose from, but we will assist you in that choice before the program starts. You now have a first mini lecture taught by Dr. Eva van Lier on one of the main components of the program, language structure and variation. But let's start with a small video clip introducing some of your fellow students to you. Hi, I'm Hilde Sinje and I'm from Spotensk. Hello, my name is Charlotte and my mother tongue is Vlaams. Hello, my name is Juliette and my mother tongue is Nederlands. Goedemiddag, mijn naam is Sean en ik ben Scots, leed van Adam Bern. Bonjour, je m'appelle Marlon en mijn langue maternelle is Frans. Cześć, ik ben naam Claudia en ik ben de kind van de Rastau en mijn Spotsky. Bravo, ik ben Anastasia en mijn mater is Rijkje. Goedemiddag, ik ben Tim en Vicky en mijn meisje is Ziek en Bogenski. Goedemiddag, ik ben Hussein en ik ben de Arabie. Hallo, mijn naam is Eva van Lier. My name is Eva van Lier and today I will tell you something about the grammatical structure of languages and about variation in the grammar of languages. You have just seen uh, some linguistic diversity in the form of the native languages of some of our first year BA students. Um, but to get you warmed up a bit more, we might uh, wonder how many languages are currently spoken in the world. Well, a rough estimate would be between six and seven thousand, uh, even though, of course, it is difficult to distinguish um, between whether we're dealing with uh, two dialects of the same language or two distinct languages. 
but um, this is usually due not so much to linguistic factors but rather to political or historical issues and putting these aside for the moment we will say uh, six to seven thousand languages currently spoken in the world uh, but not much longer I have added because in fact we are experiencing a rapid decrease of linguistic diversity approximately um, every two weeks a language dies out which is why some linguists engage in the description of languages that haven't been described properly so far and that are in danger of dying out. So here on the slide you see uh, an example of a colleague working on a language uh, of Vanuatu in the Pacific. Closer to home in the Netherlands we have three languages, Dutch, Frisian and Sign Language of the Netherlands, or NGT, the language of the deaf community. In addition, of course, we have a variety of dialects as well as regional languages such as Limburgian and a number of languages associated with different immigrant groups uh, such as Sranantongo, one of the languages of Suriname, Papiamento from the Dutch Antilles, Turkish and many others. Especially in Amsterdam, we have a wide variety of cultural and corresponding linguistic diversity. Even though this is interesting, we are by far not in the most linguistically diverse area of the world. In other parts, especially uh, Papua New Guinea, for instance, uh, about 850 lang uh, different languages are spoken. So if you just briefly look at this map of uh, New Guinea, uh, of course you cannot read all the names, but just looking at the colors, uh, you will immediately see that many different languages are spoken in relatively small pockets uh, in this area. So yes, language diversity is quite astonishing, but it is certainly not unconstrained. Not everything is possible in languages. So one of the main questions that linguists are interested in is what are the limits on language diversity and why is it these factors that pose these limits? I will try to illustrate this issue uh, with an example today on word order across the world's languages. So, a simple sentence in English might look like this, uh, the man writes a letter. So in this sentence we can distinguish three main chunks um, that are indicated here with different colors. So we start with the man, the subject of the sentence in red. In the middle we have the verb in green, writes, and at the end we have in purple the object, a letter. So these are three uh, chunks uh, ordered with uh, respect to one another in a particular way in English. But other languages may have different orderings of similar chunks. So, for example, in a language like Basque, we have the man, the subject, in the beginning, but the object, a letter, would come in the middle and writes the verb at the very end. In Maori, which is um, an indigenous language of New Zealand, as you may know, uh, we start with the verb, right? Then comes the subject, the man, and finally the object, a letter. In Malagasy, uh, that is the language of Madagascar, we also start with the verb, like in Maori, but then it's followed by uh, the object, a letter, and finally the subject, uh, the man. In Hishkariana, which is one of the many languages of uh, Brazil, we start with the object, followed by the verb, and then at the end comes the subject. In Varao, which is a language of Venezuela, again we start with the object, followed this time by the subject, and finally the verb. So we have three main chunks, the subject, the verb, the object, ordered in six different ways across the languages of the world. Uh, so all of these are attested, all the orderings, uh, but this doesn't mean that all of them are equally common. So here we see the figures. Um, the English order, SVO, subject, verb, object, is representative of about 37% of the world's languages, so it's quite common. The Basque order is even more common, subject, object, verb, 41% of the languages of the world have this. The Maori order, verb, subject, object, VSO, is less common, 7%, but still not quite rare. The final three, Malagasy, Hishkariana and Varao, are all increasingly rare. So VOS is 2%, OVS is only 0.8% and finally object, subject, verb, OSV is only 
3%. So there are very marked differences here. We may plot this frequency distribution um, on a map of the world like this, where all of the dots are individual languages. Uh, and you see uh, at the bottom here that the circles represent um, the most common uh, ordering, so SOV in blue, SVO in red, and VSO in yellow, whereas the less common or quite rare uh, orders are represented by the squares in the different colors here. In addition, you see quite a lot of gray circles. These are languages uh, with no dominant order, meaning that these languages allow a lot of variation in the ordering of these three chunks. And why this is, uh, you will learn more about when you come study with us. Um, looking at this, ma uh, this map, you may be um, interested in the fact that the orders are not um, distributed randomly, not in frequency, but also in terms of location. So we have large areas of blue, uh, large areas of red, with just a couple of blue dots in between. Uh, the islands here are all in yellow, for instance. Uh, so this represents, on the one hand, language families. So languages that descend from the same ancestor may also have the same uh, basic word order uh, as that ancestor language. On the other hand, this may also reflect aerial relations between languages, so languages that are not from the same family but are spoken in each other's vicinity for a long time may also share structural features, including word order. But what I would like to focus on today is why it is that these uh, orders, uh, the circles, are so much more common than the uh, square orders. If you uh, look carefully and you disregard for the moment the position of the verb, you will see that in these orders over here, the more common ones, the subject precedes the object. Whereas in the less common and um, really rare ones, the object uh, precedes the subject. So it's the other way around. So we may conclude from this um, very roughly that um, there is a strong tendency in the languages of the world for the subject to precede the object. Uh, and a possible explanation for this might be that there is, if you like, a natural flow of action from the agent and instigator of an action, typically uh, the subject, to the undergoer of an action, typically the object. So human languages uh, apparently prefer to mirror this order, this natural flow of action in their grammatical structure. And this uh, principle that language structures may reflect um, communicative preferences of humans has been described by an American linguist, uh, John Dubois, uh, as follows, grammars code best what speakers do most. Yet, we see a lot of variation, so we still need to explain that different grammars seem to do different things well and in different ways. So, at least um, a partial answer to this question might lie in the, uh, in the connection between linguistic diversity and social cognition. So language can be seen as a cultural tool. It's used for communication and for social cohesion. Um, and one example that shows you how uh, communicative, um, sorry, cultural aspects can end up in linguistic structure is kinship terminology. We'll look here briefly at Hawaiian kinship terminology. Um, you see here in the middle uh, the ego with uh, the mother and the father and the sister and brother here. And looking at the terminology here, you will see that in Hawaiian, not only the mother, but also the mother's sister and the father's sister are called mother or the Hawaiian equivalent of mother. On similarly, you see that the f not just the father is called father, but also the father's brother and the mother's brother that we in uh, English would call the uncle. And the same goes for the children. So not just the sister and brother or sisters and brothers, but also the cousins. So the children of the aunts and uncles are sisters and brothers to the ego. So this might be an indication that in um, Hawaiian society, the extended family has a function that is more similar to the nuclear family, family in Western societies. Well, to give you um, one more taste of how cultural aspects uh, influence a linguistic structure, we will look at um, 
what goes into a Dalabon verb. Dalabon is an indigenous language of Australia, spoken in the north uh, of the country, and this is a Dalabon verb, uh, broken down into subparts which represent uh, separate meanings. And here you see um, the translation of each of the separate bits. So the first bit is translated as, as apprehensive, the second as dual disharmonic, tell you in a bit what that is. Um, the third bit is unbeknownst. Uh, the fourth is actually the main part of the verb. Uh, it's a respectful form of the verb to go. And then the final element here is um, an indicator of time reference or tense, non-past in this case. So altogether we might um, translate this in English as follows. I'm afraid that, that's the apprehensive part, the two of them who are in disharmonic generations with respect to one another, such as a father and son, that's the dis, uh, dual disharmonic part, might be sneaking around, so going around unbeknownst by someone who should know, and by choosing this respectful form of the verb to go, I indicate, so the speaker indicates, that one of those um, I'm referring to is a mother-in-law's brother or a comparable relative. So this tells us, for instance, that um, mother-in-law's brothers or comparable relatives have a special status in Dalabon culture and that this requires a special use of the verb form. So just to wrap up, um, we see that language um, uh, diversity is quite amazing, but it's certainly not random. So patterns of linguistic form may be shaped by functional factors such as communicative and cultural salience. And this is reflected in the distribution of such patterns over the many languages of the world. So far, I've talked uh, mainly about spoken languages, um, but in fact, sign languages also have a prominent uh, position in our BA program. A special characteristic of our program is that you can specialize in, a sign, in sign languages in a special track. So sign languages really are just as different from one another as our spoken languages. So the track on sign linguistics has a content that is comparable to the track on spoken languages. It's just that sign languages rather than spoken languages are the main object of study. The following clip shows you just how different sign languages can be. You see first a clip on Russian sign language and then in sign language of the Netherlands. And after the, tr the clip, I'll give the floor back to Kees Hengeveld, who will give you more information about the content of our program. Thank you. Yes, let's now look in more detail at the way the program is organized. First thing that's important to know is that the University of Amsterdam organizes its year in two semesters. Every semester consists of two blocks of eight weeks and then one block of four weeks. During the eight week blocks you have two parallel courses. During the four week block you have one intensive uh, course. So the semester takes 20 weeks in all. We have two semesters, which makes 40 weeks per year. And as you can uh, easily deduct from that, the year is long, it's intensive. There's only two months of break in the summer and one week with Christmas. So you have to count on a, a program to which you have to dedicate quite a lot of time. In the first year, <coughs> you take linguistics courses and at the same time, as I mentioned before, you take language X courses. So you can apply the notions that you acquire in the linguistics courses to the language that you are studying. The courses that you take in the linguistics part are an introduction to linguistics, then a course on phonetics, on speech sounds, then a course on transcription, where you learn how to transcribe languages using a special uh, phonetic alphabet. Then you take a course in morphology, which is about formation of words. Then on social linguistics, which is about how language functions in society. And finally, in the last block, we have a research project where you can apply all the things that you've learned during the year uh, in a research project with fellow students.
what you didn't see in this overall schema is that during the year you will also acquire all kinds of academic skills. They're part of the courses. They're incorporated in those courses. So you'll learn basic things like recording speech, transcribing speech, you learn how to formulate a research question, you learn how to carry out a small research project, and you learn how to write down your results in good quality academic English. All these skills come together in the research project at the end of the first year. When you go to the second year, you have two options. You can either take a 100% linguistics program with only courses in general linguistics, or you can continue the study of your language X and take a smaller amount of linguistics courses. <coughs> in each case, you have the same uh, structural courses, courses on the structure of language, but of course there are some uh, courses have to be dropped from the linguistics program if you continue with your language X, and those are particularly those courses that study linguistic behavior. In the third year, you can then still continue with your language X or not. And in the third year, two important activities are new. One is the fact that you can have a minor program in this year where you study a secondary uh, specialization. I'll come back to that later. And the other thing is that you have to write your BA thesis in this year. In preparation of the BA thesis, we teach you research methods and statistics first. Then you have a specialization course where you can explore a potential topic for your thesis, and then you write the actual thesis. If you have the language X variety of the program, then your specialization course will be on that language, and your thesis will of course also be on that language. I already mentioned the minor program. In a minor, minor you acquire uh, capacities that lie outside the domain of linguistics, so you take that uh, minor outside the linguistics department. The idea is that with a minor you have a second specialization, which qualifies you for other types of master programs that you might be interested in, but also qualifies you uh, for broader, uh, broader jobs in the society. The minors that are on offer in the university uh, are in the wide variety of topics. Uh, I mentioned a few here, musicology, psychology, philosophy, um, many other topics are possible, like anthropology, also interesting for linguists. But of course you could also choose to do yet another language, right? Not only your language X, you might have taken like Czech in the first year and want to add Russian to your inventory in the third year. We now go to a other, another important uh, component of our program, linguistic behavior. Our uh, senior lecturer, Judith Rispens, will give you a mini lecture on that topic. And while she prepares, we will look at a small video. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, so thank you, Kees. My name is uh, Judith Rispens. And indeed, I will tell you something about language uh, development, and I've called it here the miracle of language learning. So why uh, do I think language development is indeed a miracle? Well, children learn in a quite a limited amount of time uh, quite a complex set of linguistic rules, and no one teaches them those rules. So they just seem to acquire those rules. So a big question in the field is, how are ch children able to learn these um, uh, linguistic rules? Now, there are several theories about this, and today, in this very short class, I'll zoom in on one uh, of those theories, which is that statistical learning facilitates language development. Okay, so what is statistical learning? So this is the ability that uh, someone, uh, a human being at least, um, can compute a rule from input uh, that person um, experience. So rule computation is based on tracking regularities in the input that someone experiences. So in the uh, case of language development, development, it's about extracting linguistic rules from the linguistic input that a child hears. 
And language is indeed a very irregular system, um, so that, which means that there are often language elements co-occurring. And I'll show you a few examples. So I here made a division between adjacent and non-adjacent co-occurrences. So in the first uh, three sentences, um, I walk on the street, I walk on streets, and I walk on the, you can see that the street really should, uh, uh, belongs together and should be together. The sentence, I walk on the street is ungrammatical, just like I walk on the. So a determiner, the, always needs something else, and a noun often really wants a determiner in front of it. Now, there are also non-adjacent co-occurrences, and non-adjacent means that the co-occurrence is there, but not next to each other. So this is a, uh, a sentence like, he walks on the street, or she cycles on the street, where you can see that there's a co-occurrence between the pronoun he and the s, the, verb, the, the marking on the verb. And why is it non-adjacent? Um, because uh, there's always an element intervening between the pronoun and the s marker. So here it's the verb walk, it could also be the verb cycle. Okay, so tricking those regularities, those co-occurrences of linguistic elements, helps uh, or allows one to really deduce rules. So the example that I gave with he walks on the street is a rule called subject-verb agreement. There needs to be an agreement between the verb and its subject. And the example of the street um, means that determiners are, are uh, always combined with nouns in a so-called noun phrase. So statistical learning can facilitate developing these linguistic rules. It could also help facilitating word segmentation. Now, word segmentation is uh, the first thing actually that children or infants uh, have to do when they are born. And this is difficult because adults do not pause between each word. So the real task for an infant is what is a word and what is not a word. So how do infants learn word boundaries? Well, there's a hypothesis that um, uh, word learning, or at least detecting word boundaries, is uh, facilitated by statistical learning. And I'll show you an experiment. It's a famous experiment uh, done by the researchers Seffron, Eslin, and Newport, and I'll show you how it goes. Okay, so here's just uh, one more graph to il illustrate why you can't rely on pauses in order to de detect a word boundary. So here you see that there's uh, this kind of like big blob of activity um, uh, at the first bit, uh, but actually it's, there's no pauses, there are no pauses, but there are three words, where are the, and uh, in the word between you see some pauses, but it's one word. So you can't really rely on those pauses to detect word boundaries. Okay, so let's assume uh, there's a child and uh, she doesn't know the words pretty and baby, but of course a child may, he may hear pretty baby. The question is, how does a child know that actually um, this you know, speech stream are two words? Because um, pretty baby could also be segmented like pretty baby or pretty baby or pretty baby. But of course, a child also hears um, lots of other words, uh, among which maybe pretty bottle, pretty eyes, ooh, what a pretty dress. So if you track the regularities of the inputs, of the uh, co-occurrences of the syllables in the linguistic inputs, you could in a way compute the likelihood that these syllables occur next to each other. So because pretty is a word, pr and t will often be combined together. t bay uh, could be an option, pretty baby is not a word, so the chances that this is actually a word is much smaller because the uh, uh, syllables are only combined if they, these are um, uh, combined in the phrase pretty baby, but not in other phrases. Okay, so this experiment. Um, the experiment uh, was done to investigate whether children can segment words from a continuous speech stream solely based on statistical learning, on tracking those um, and computing the, the likelihood of, of, of uh, co-occurrences. And the experimenters uh, had 24 infants coming to the lab. They were eight months old, and they, their only task that they had to do was listening for two minutes to a tape with continuous speech. 
This continuous speech consists of the following, um, um, well, syllables, words I want to say, but syllables. And these were the syllables to, ki, bu, gi, ko, ba, kopi, lati, polu. So these syllables were uttered uh, one after the other, and it was it's very important, so I'll stress it again. There were no pauses, there was no stress, no prosody. So children would, would hear a tape going like toki, boogie, go, bagi for two minutes. And the experimenters uh, had a fixed order of presentation in, their, um, uh, in this uh, tape that they played. So that means that some sequences of three syllables were much more frequently um, uh, presented together than other syllables. And I'll show you how it goes. So here are the, the 12 syllables, and the colors represent um, fixed combinations. So tokibu was a fixed combination, kigoba, gopila, and tipolu. So the likelihood that tokibu occurred together was very high, it was one. This in contrast to a combination which children sometimes hear, boogigo. So boogigo was less likely huh, in its uh, statistical um, uh, computation than Toki Bu. So how uh, did the experiment proceed? Well, an infant had to sit on the lap of a parent and just listen to this uh, uh, tape with syllables. And afterwards, there was a test phase, because the experimenters wanted to see whether children made a difference after listening to the tape in discriminating between very high likely words, the Toki Bu, or less likely words, bugigo, and the likelihood, again, is based on this statistical um, um, algorithm. Now, you can't ask infants, what word do you like better? Or do you think that there's a word in the speech stream? So children um, uh, were, uh, were, uh, um, und were undergoing uh, a certain uh, procedure, much used with infant linguistic research. That's called the head turn procedure. How does it work? So a child sits on the lap of uh, one of its parents, and um, I'll show you the setup. And there are two loudspeakers, one on the left and one on the right side of the lab. And these uh, loudspeakers also have some lights uh, on them. So a word is played, and there's also a light um, attracting the uh, attention of the infant. And um, uh, you either play the high likely word or you play the less likely word. An experimenter can see whether a child prefers to look to a certain, um, uh, uh, in a certain direction, to the left or to the right. So the experimenter can track whether a child discriminates between these two words. So the results actually show that in the infant discriminated between high likely and less likely words. So this shows that word segmentation was done based on statistical learning, as the children had no other cues in order to detect word boundaries. Okay, so this was the experiment I want to tell you about, and I would just like to um, end with the last uh, final note, that at the University of Amsterdam we do um, similar research. We have a linguistics lab there, and we in, uh, investigate linguistic behavior using different methodologies. So here you see um, uh, a child, an infant, well, a child, waiting to participate in an EEG experiment. So um, the child is fitted with a cap, an electrode will be put on it. And um, so we have um, different methodological setups and uh, different populations are being tested in our lab. Okay, so I gave you a flavor about the content of our program. And I guess that you're also curious about the form uh, of your education. So now we will give you a short video impression of three types of classes, a lecture, a seminar, and a language class. And after that, we have our international student, Sinja Stentoft, who will talk about what it's like to study in Amsterdam. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sinja, and I'm a first year international BA of linguistic student. Um, I chose to study Italian as my language X. I'm going to play it after. <laughs> um, I chose to study Italian as my language X because I first and foremost think that it's a beautiful language and I really enjoy the culture. As I was growing up, I was used to moving around to a different country every three to five years. So learning a new language was a very prominent theme in my upbringing. And having experienced this link between people and language and the importance of communication, I decided that I wanted to understand how language functions in itself. Therefore, I decided to apply for linguistics. I also think that language is one of the most powerful things that is, has ever existed. Um, 
and therefore I also think that it provides one with endless opportunities and possibilities. So I thought, why not try and understand it? The clip that we're going to show you is from a lecture, seminar and a language X. The first one is from a lecture. Now, these are intended for all students, and this year we are a total of approximately 70, which feels to be just about the right amount, because as an individual, you don't go overlooked, but you're also not in the spotlight constantly. And the lecturers, they do try their best to make the students engage more um, by, for example, having funny examples and also using a website called Menti, in which they can pose questions and you can... Um, vote online anonymously on which answer you think is the most correct and then afterwards you discuss them. This is a clip from a seminar. The seminars are smaller, they're taught with approximately 20 students. The content of the seminars do vary depending on the course. For example, in the first course, Introduction to Linguistics, the seminars were purely um, targeting our academic writing, or our academic skills, sorry. So, for example, reading an article and analysing it and seeing if it's trustworthy. But for our current course in phonetics, they're split up. So we have one seminar group which is um, solemnly for our academic skills and then one which is uh, focusing on phonetic components from the course. So you read the article? Yeah. So you should know. L2, Immersion Education School of Best Science. That's fine, right? But when you're reporting your article, you have to use it. Oh, no. Yeah, so it's part of This was taken during a Swedish language X class. Now, all the language X classes are different. For example, Dutch is taught at the INTT, which is a language school in Amsterdam. But, for example, languages like Russian or Polish or Italian are taught with um, students from different classes. So, for example, if a student is studying Scandinavian studies and decides to take Swedish, like some of the students in this video, then you'd be joining their class. Or me taking Italian, I am also with students who are taking Italian studies. Now, I will first tell you a bit about Amsterdam. There we go. There are a ton of expats and international students, which in my opinion makes Amsterdam the ideal city to study linguistics. Walking down the street, anywhere in Amsterdam, you will hear countless different languages, and you're also confronted with a lot of different cultures. I mean, you could basically decide that on Monday you want to eat dinner in Thailand, on Tuesday in Italy, and on Wednesday in America. And there is also a lot of different supermarkets that specialize in importing traditional products from several countries. So for example, if you are feeling homesick, I can almost guarantee you with 100% certainty that you will be able to find these special cookies that you use to eat at home. Now, Amsterdam is probably one of the most picturesque cities in all of, of the Netherlands. There's lots of um, canals in the city center that are aligned with tall trees, and there's countless cafes and restaurants where you can study. But if you do prefer studying on campus, then you have a variety to choose from because they're spread all the way around town. Um, Amsterdam is also, oh no, the main campus for linguistics is the PC Hoft House, which is located close to Central Station. Amsterdam is also a very busy city. Um, there's always something going on on a weekly basis. There is a handful of events and parties and Facebook is the best way to stay on top of that and keep informed if there is one that you want to go to or not. There is also VOS, which is the Study Association for Linguistics. They organize study sessions, trips, and they also organize weekly drinks at a cafe called Deep, which is just around the corner from the PC Hoft House. They also organize bigger parties, for example, for Halloween, they hosted a party and combined it with other faculty so that you could kind of mix and mingle and get to know more people. In order to get around Amsterdam, public transport is a possibility. It's also very easily accessible, but it can be expensive. So most people prefer biking, but you do have to be aware of the traffic because Amsterdam is a very busy city. So lots of people trying to get from A to B. Do keep in mind that Amsterdam is also expensive. Living costs um, for a week can be up to 100 euros and housing is pricey and hard to find. So make sure that you start looking early. The university also does offer um, housing for international students for their first year, but also make sure that you apply early so you can be certain that you get a room. For each language X and linguistics course, you also have to purchase books, and these books can vary in cost from anywhere to 30 to 100 euros. 
For further information, please note down the details on the current slide. We're going to be online now to answer any standing questions. And thank you for joining us today, and I do hope to see you soon in Amsterdam.